Mike. <coughs> Welcome to the Trader Park Show tonight. I'm Chris Ritter. I'm the producer of the show. You, you know Gabriel, you know, yes. uh, our panel here. We've got Gavino. We've got Pokey. We've got our distinguished Hellraiser, Paul Hernandez. And on this side, we have Mike Lee of the Republican Party. We got Nelson Linder, president of the local NAACP, and Robert Muhammad, who is the local national Islam leader. And it was tonight we're going to talk about issues on race and, and racism and, and all that in America today. Not only is it affecting America on a large scale, it's also affecting us here in the trailer park. And we're going to have a good dis discussion tonight about issues that are facing our community and how we can either solve it or, you know, things that we can do to bring us together as a people because regardless if we're African-American, Mexican-American, or like me, Italian-American, the one thing that holds us all together is we're Americans. And, you know, this country is a great country and we need to get together as a people and quit having these racial divides that we have going on. And anything else you'd like to add, my friend here? No, I think you said it perfectly. All right, well, have your seat. <laughs> uh, anyway, Thank welcome you, to the Trader Park Show, and enjoy it, and hopefully we have a great discussion tonight that's going to be productive and discuss things. Have yeah. a good one. I'm off to my room. <laughs> All right, All right, thank you. Well, they said we didn't have any women on the panel, but we got one that started the Ma, whole thing. thank you, Ma. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, so, that's my statement, you. and we read the slates at the beginning, so, you know, hopefully people can read those and see what's going on. Right. Ten four. Excellent. So welcome back. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Trailer Park Show. Uh, as we met, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pokey mentioned, we're doing a, a, what's being called the uh, Race in the Trailer Park, otherwise known as uh, How to Make the White Man Cry. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> Robert D'Artagnan Thomas is out there too, isn't he? Yes. And, and uh, the story he, he'll be up later. Why this came up is, is involving a video that involved one of my friends uh, concerning uh, race relations and how people were, were uh, admonishing. I'll be perfectly honest with you. From the way I was looking at the video, we had an African American, we had a Korean national, uh, or a Korean American, and a Native American that were talking to uh, a, a white a white man, and in the uh, in there they're talking about why it's why it, he was wrong uh, for being white, hey, why yes. it was good for for everybody to be you know be, um, or or because of the situations that they were in, it, it was this person's fault, um, and, and basically saying it's you know even though it really wasn't. But it was basically um, the white man's fault for all the troubles that they were in. And due to a lengthy discussion uh, between myself and, and Pokey and, uh, and our friend Robert and a few other people, uh, we got to thinking that it was time that we have a discussion about um, race. Race here, relations here, trailer park here, style. Uh, here in, in Austin. And, and primarily here in Austin and also not, well, and we can expand it out to the state and if we want it to go even further, let's go ahead and do that part as well. Um, and so that's why we, you know, we're, we're here as a community, we're here as a group to try to see what we can do uh, to identify some of the issues without making Pokey cry. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and then go from there and try to improve on what needs to be done and how, how as a community, how as a trailer park show, how as, how as a group, we all can make uh, something better. So uh, that being said, if it's okay, we'd like to start at the far end with Mr. Mohammed. Um, give, us, give us a little bit of uh, uh, who you are and what you do and a little bit of history about, about you. Uh, I'm Brother Robert Muhammad. I'm student minister of the Nation of Islam, a local representative of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan in Muhammad Mosque number 64 here in the city of Austin and in the central, central Texas uh, area. Um, I'm, I'm a native Austinite, born and raised here in the city of Austin. You don't find too many of us here. Um, um, this particular subject is uh, uh, near and dear to my heart because obviously I'm a black male, uh, born in the 70s, uh, raised in the 80s. Uh, so I had the opportunity to experience uh, one explosive uh, event in high school, the uh, Rodney King verdict. Um, and that forever uh, uh, made an imprint on my, on my heart and in, in my mind. And so uh, I'm very passionate about the uh, uh, condition of our people, particularly black men uh, in the United States of America. And, um, and so that's a little bit about me. I, 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 I am passionate about uh, seeking justice and uh, seeking equality, seeking freedom for all, uh, regardless of uh, class, creed, or color. Okay. I am Nelson Linder, President of the Austin NAACP. 
I'm also a 30-year awesome business person in the insurance industry, uh, on my own business. I came here in the 81 from um, Macon, Georgia. I was born in Macon, Georgia in 1958. I grew up in the South. It gives me a little different perspective on, on a lot of things. Um, I guess my concern is, I mean, in order to really address the issue of race, there has to be a certain amount of honesty. And unfortunately, we've had hundreds of years of, of fiction, not facts, and, and, and public policy that's been used as a political tool. And as a result, a lot of folks are confused. You can't really talk about race until you have a certain amount of understanding uh, about what exists. And, and there is a factual basis for race. And I would say there are many countries in the world, like for example Germany, that did a, a very good job of dealing with the Holocaust in terms of educating the public about the situation. And as a result, they don't tolerate uh, nonsense. They don't tolerate fiction that's based on fact. <coughs> Even in South Africa, when Mandela came out of prison, he made it a point to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So I think if you're talking about race, you got to first of all look at fact versus fiction. This country has a history, and things occurred. We have to be able to look at that from an educational standpoint and agree on certain basic things. We haven't done that. So as a result, folks are at each other's throat based on falsehoods, and in many cases, reality. So until the country itself takes responsibility and sets the record straight, we're going to have a lot of problems. And as a final point, there's a fellow named Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh. I remember seeing the start of the Vietnam War. He said, look, when they won that war, of course, um, Saigon became Ho Chi Minh City. Saigon right now is one of the most prosperous cities in the world. He said, look, he said, if you are holding on to the American ideas of who you were when they came here, we can't help you in Vietnam. We got to reteach Vietnam history. You have to be a Vietnamese again because they've been ruined by white supremacy. Profound comment. What he was saying is, look, the history has been turned upside down. Until you know yourself and all the factors, we can't have an honest conversation. So he gave folks a chance to be re-educated. I think America's the mm -hmm. same way. We have mm -hmm. to turn back and re-educate people about this country's history, what has occurred. Can't change the path, but we certainly can understand it. So until we understand it properly and honestly, we can't really go forward. As a result, these things keep reoccurring. And that's, that's kind of why I'm here. Okay. I'm Michael Lee. I'm from originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. Out, really, actually, I'm from, I grew up in the only self-governing all-black community in the country, a little place called Lincoln Heights. I grew up in that town with six, about 16,000 folks. I think there were, let's see, George Liggins was the one white person who lived there in the city, and that was it. And so uh, my experience, my educational experience for my first 10 years of high school where it was totally black. I went to small white liberal arts college, for college and I went to SMU Law School after, after, after college. My uh, views on race and race relations is really shaped in large part by my own personal experience. I was one of two black, 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 black people who joined, uh, little kid, I was five years old, I joined all white baseball team. I didn't care and, and I think that I just went down and joined the team without a glove by the way. The white guy was a manager, dumped, dumped a ball, bat, and stuff out, out, the, out the army duffel bag. I went and picked up a glove, and I became a catcher because I didn't have a glove. But um, as far as race is concerned, I just believe that, I mean, we have to admit that it's the original sin with which America was born. It's been codified in the Constitution of the Three-Fifths Amendment. Now, in my, my philosophy has always been conservative. When I was a teenager, conservative meant you were for a slow and gradual change. But its off definition has been altered over the years. Liberal meant you just change and just see what happens. And it's slow, deliberate change always seemed to make sense to me, just see what's happening first. But as far as race, race nowadays, I hate the fact that it's, you can't tell the truth now because of political correctness. People get mad, get angry, and if race is a problem, how can we solve the problem without talking about it, honestly? We can't solve it by playing like it's not there. And I think that uh, it's a problem for America. My, my, my thinking is real simple. I think that what's good for the black community is good for America, period. Mm -hmm. Because we have the, when you have problems in the black community, it costs money. There's there are financial costs, economic costs, and there are social costs. The black family is really the victim right now. Uh, I think that if we be, we have to begin to really talk about it and tussle with it and wrestle with it in order to get past it. Uh, I, I believe that in large measures, as a, as many black folk believe feel like 
white folk need to acknowledge the wrongdoing. Some feel like there should there should be some reparations for it. I, um, in my own my own view, based on my legal training and whatnot, I like a strict constructionist. The Three Fifths Amendment said you counted five slaves as three white white people for purposes of enumeration only. That's that's what it says. Right. Well, it's, it's just, just leave it right there. Being a strict constructionist for purposes of enumeration, no other purpose. Um, but I think that the only way to get past it is to be able to honestly talk about it openly and honestly and just tell the truth. They always say, I, I've always heard truth sets you free. Mm -hmm. Let's just tell the truth. What's wrong is wrong, what's right is right. There's all, I also believe this is, it's the truth also that you have to take responsibility for yourself. As an African American, you're in the situ you're here you're in America. It seems to me that many black folk act like they're not part of America. If ISIS is here, my behind is going too. When the towers came down in New York, it didn't just come down on, on white people. It came down on whoever's in the building. It came down on every, any, any, person, any person in the building, whether they're American or not. I'm an American of color. Mm -hmm. I had nothing to do with that. That's the accident, accident of birth. I'm just, just born. You deal with it, but you deal with what you, ca what you are and what you came with. And uh, to me, in the, in the country, we're here, and we have to deal with the situation as it is. Racism exists. I don't think, I think there's some confusion between bigotry, prejudice, and racism. Many people think a black person can be racist. I don't think so. Because no matter how I feel about, no matter how many, how many black people feel that don't, don't like or dislike white people, that can't affect your life. It doesn't affect you at all. Mm -hmm. That's just some people don't like you. But if you happen to be black and white, and white people don't like you, the system does things to you. And I think that distinguishes racism from bigotry and prejudice. But I, I sometimes wonder, and I talk to my little baby brother a lot, I say, what's the end game? Okay, let's say white people jump up and say, okay, yeah, we racist. What can we do to straighten it out? Well, we're going to have to jump up pretty quick here. Okay. <laughs> what, what, what can we do? Not what, to me, you know. What can we do to straighten it out? Is it is the bottom line... Uh, reparations we just want white people to feel guilty or what but that being said I just want to add before I forget that I think the challenge that every black American faces is this you have to decide whether you're a victim or you're an opportunist because there have been black folk who did things good things positive things successful things in a hell of a lot of worse situation than what we're in now I just learned very recently that Houston Tillotson was before UT Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I had to think about that for a minute. And that's a private black school that was put there before the state school. Is that's that right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I didn't I, know that either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, but that being said, we just need, I think the black folks need to play, be, play smarter and fight harder and work harder. And, and more. And, and, yeah. Well, we also, and then also on the panel, or also on, on the, on the uh, actually on the, on the, with us here today is, uh, in the high chair. In the high chair, we got Michael Cargill. That's right. My name is Michael Cargill, the owner of Central Texas Gunnerworks and the host of Come and Talk at Radio. I'm just here to learn. I just okay. want to learn and and see how we can make it a better place. There you go. Paul Hernandez. Yeah, but I'm yes, going to throw sir. some rocks, though, so get ready. <laughs> um, my name is Paul Hernandez. I was born in Brackenridge Hospital in 1946. And... Uh, I know Austin pretty well. I've been quite observant since I was a child. I used to play in the river, and there's a time that you can actually drink water out of that river. And <clears throat> I'm going to try it today, but uh, white man's <laughs> fault. Yep. Well, <laughs> it's somebody's fault. Power plant. It ain't my fault. Oh, white man's power plant fault. There yeah. You know. yeah. Well, actually. All the water was coming down from the hills, so it's their fault. There you go. <laughs> but anyway, um, this whole situation, I brought this T-shirt on purpose. It was given to me a long time ago, and I forgot who gave it to me. But it has a Spaniard, and it has a native actually killing the Spaniard. And that Spaniard is European. And if you know your history, you know about the conquest 
when the Spaniards uh, came into the Americas, or what we now call America, and <clears throat> slaughtered over a million of the natives. Very few people know about us. I call myself a Chicano. Now, Mexican American, Hispanic, Latino, all those terms fit me. American citizen fits me too. I wear it very well. <coughs> the thing that bothers me the most though is that we Mexican Americans, Chicanos, don't know our own history. The reason we don't know our own history is it's been blocked for us, from us. It started with the Spaniards and that conquest. When that conquest occurred, the way they conquered the people is take away the language, take away the history, and you've got them. They don't know who they are, and they don't know how to communicate anymore. So that's been done to the native peoples. And very few people know that us, Mexican Americans, Chicanos, as I call myself, that we exist. A friend of mine wrote a song, he's uh, a jazz artist, he called it Invisible Society. And there's some lines in there like, I fought your wars, and I came home, and I can't even buy a house because the bank won't lend me the money because I'm not making any income because I just got back from the war. Now, it got several lines that it talks about us, the invisible society, like being the bus boys, being the dishwashers, that people just, I mean, we, they're oblivious. And that's where I come from. But I've been very fortunate. In fact, I've been privileged. As a child, I got a very good education, private education, Catholic education. And I was on my way to becoming a priest when I found out that you couldn't be with women and <laughs> Second, that did it for me. Yeah, that did it. But <laughs> the second reason was that I had to give up my life with my family, and I could not do that. Now, we people are very, very fortunate to be here today, and I thank my friend Pokey. What? For the invitation. Well, you better do it in a hurry because uh, we ain't got <laughs> all night here. All right. I got you. I'll tell you what. We're here and we're staying here. How's yeah, that? my friend Paul Hernandez. <laughs> and of course, it, we, also, we also have uh, James O. Pokey Ritter, the, the, the uh, white man that we're going to try to make Christ's name. Uh, <laughs> you want us all to make a little statement too? Or you want to start asking some questions? <laughs> no, 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 exactly. I, like, I like to make a statement if, have, uh, if <laughs> the powers to be will allow me to. Yeah, oh, go oh, ahead. Oh, 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 <laughs> Uh, yeah, he's we running this thing, so. <laughs> well, you know, I'm an Austin native myself. I'm born and raised here in Austin. I'll leave my thing out and of here. Uh, huh? <laughs> okay. And uh, it's interesting because when you talk about the issue of race, recently there was a committee or some kind of government entity where they were addressing racism or something they were they wanted fifty thousand dollars or something like I that i can do it for half price <laughs> yeah we can do it so yeah. the other one is where being living in austin the same old this old saying of repeated saying of oh that that barrier ih 35 barrier well that's something they created well y'all created because <laughs> i've never seen it as a barrier but if your mind Thanks that way. Thanks it that way. Every time I, uh, I'm about the university, you talk about, well, we need to break that barrier. I said, well, you're the one that created it, so, you know, you should be able to break it. But when it comes to race, it hits home because, for example, in my family, I have eight, seven sisters. And they're married, some, a couple of them are married to Anglos because they went to the military. 
a couple of them married to African Americans. So when we all get together, it's interesting that there's no distinction in race because it's all family. And I think that 50 years from now, people are gonna say, you know, you know that back then they were talking about race, you know, and, and how interesting that it, that that was an issue back then in the day, because you know that's something that's taught. We all know that racism is taught. It's not something you're born with. So I also thought for a long time I was privileged living in Austin and in a certain community, a protected community, uh, one that no one else. And I said, man, we're lucky. You know, nobody wants to come and live with us. We, we but it was that it, we were being segregated. That's because you had a <laughs> power plant right there, buddy. It meant that we were. That's right. At, you know, Austin, for what it is, it's a, a segregated, racist city. And, but, you know, we forgive those. Hold on here a minute. That, uh, <laughs> Hold on here a minute. Be, because now, we're racist. How come me and Paul were drinking beer in my dump truck? I had to buy the beer. Yeah. Well, because you had to pay for pass, you know. Oh, pass, was I paying for, for pass? Pass, 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 pass sins. So we even now? But, but yeah, that, that, that whole issue of race, even today, to me, is very interesting because the same people that, that tend to lead the discussion in other venues are the ones that practice it every day, you know. So to me, it's a very simple answer. It's just, if you are, just stop it. Come on just down stop, there. Just stop being a race, you know. No, stop can't. treating set, people based wait, on their wait color. Wait until some people die. Put that microphone up there and tell us about it. And then, of course, there's uh, me. Anyway, um, and, and for those people that are aware, I, I grew up in El Paso, uh, experienced, uh, came, grew up in the, at the end of uh, the Chicano movement, uh, youngest of eight. So I got to experience some of the, the stuff that went on during the, Chicano, uh, the end of the Chicano movement and then the new experiences of what, what it was being identified as saying you have to be white when it came to being an adult. Uh, and you experience that, that, that whole movement. Uh, I've been, just for the, for the record, so everybody knows, I've been chased by I've been, I've been followed by cops, I've been identified by cops, I've been racial, racially profiled, not only by, by, by every uh, law enforcement office, that, uh, agency that, uh, in the town that I've lived in, but I've also been uh, racially profiled by immigration, uh, because we live by the border, um, and then every other state agency that's out there. So uh, I've had my own views, I've had my own situations with, with uh, experiencing racism, not only from people that tell me uh, you, can, you can manage a job because you speak their, could you speak their language, uh, but also dealing with uh, other people in regards to institutional racism, but also being, dealing with racism from our own kind. So that being said, everybody talked about identifying, um, acknowledging the fact that there's racism out there, and, and acknowledging that, uh, that it has to be said, that there, there has been racism um, of one kind or another, and, and predominantly the, the one that's been notified, has been, has been read a lot uh, in, in the history books is how, they, how, how uh, the black man has been treated by the white man, um, which, is, which we won't deny. We're not going to deny that that's, that that's been truthful, okay? Uh, but also in American history, we, we also had racism that was experiencing by, by Mexicans towards the white people. We also had racism between, um, between white people against themselves when, the, when America was created in the form of what they called indentured servants. Indentured servants. Um, for those of people that are familiar with what went on there, uh, there was crossbreeding. We had people that were uh, moved that if they didn't meet certain standards, they, they were not denied or they were not approved the, uh, the passage of being identified as a free man. And this is prim primarily with poor Irishmen. Um, and eventually to the point where there was even ways to try to make stronger people uh, because, because they were going to be working on the farms even better. So what do we do? How, how, what, what would your ideas, and, and I asked the panel here, what, what would we need to do to, ident to say, yes, we, we know that there was racism out there. We, we can all say that. But how do we educate the people? How do we educate the people that are as old as us, if not a little bit older, and the young people that, yes, it happened? And where do we go from there? And I, and I leave the panel open to, to any questions. <coughs> uh, well, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would like to say and offer, um, you know, the transatlantic slave trade was one of the most horrific um, events in the history of time of this world. And <coughs> the condition of black men and women in America today, uh, the condition that you find us in is a side effect of what happened during that time period. We could talk about racism, but as Nelson said, is that we have to be brutally honest mm -hmm. 
That's the first step. We have to be honest with what has happened, what is happening, and if we don't fix what is happening, what will continue to happen. And so, um, but I think after we began a conversation of discourse about what has happened, mm -hmm. because many people want to say, well, that happened centuries ago, get over it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But the Jewish community has a slowing, slogan, never again. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that we admit how brutal the transatlantic slave was, mm -hmm. and we admit the condition that we are in today is in part a side effect of what happened uh, some 460 years ago and that we begin the discourse to figure out what we can do to fix this. Now, um, the, the difficulty is, yes, there was indigenous servancy. Yes, there was uh, uh, racism on the part of uh, the Europeans that came over here against Japanese, against black people, against Mexicans. But their culture, to a certain degree, has been left intact. When you see Robert Muhammad, you see a man that was born with a name that is a derivative from his owner, from his slave master. These are the types, you see, um, you see a move from the legislation, you see in, in, in Texas, to redefine slavery. How do you redefine factual, actual factual history? and you want to change the images in the social studies textbooks to show slaves that looked as if they are stressed, as if they are hurting, as if they're in pain, and to those that have images of smiles on their face, as if they were participating in uh, a capitalist program where they were making money and they had a choice. So when these things continue to be perp uh, per uh, perpetrated, then you only extend um, um, this mindset and so the scripture says as a man thinketh in his heart so is he not that because you think you're something you are that but you and i are the sum total of our thoughts and so when you look at uh brutal cases um and and some may disagree with this but when you look at the mike brown case when you look at the sandra bland case when you look at the tamir rice case when you look at various cases just the exchange from officers who happen to be white and the black people that they have pulled over, just the exchange itself, if we would delve into the out attitude and the mentality of individuals who at a certain point, their actions expose racism and they've been able to hide behind a blue wall and it's become a haven for individuals that have that in their heart. But just if we look at the video, let's, let's not, we, we, we don't even have to talk about the law and, and do you know your rights and all of those kinds of things, but let's just look at the spirit of the exchange. And so, but we have to begin to address it. But you know, part of the reason that it is, people don't want to address it because if you address it, you have to come to some type of admittance and if you admit that you've done some wrong, then you have to be responsible and some type of repair for that. And guess what? Even though Pokey was not present during the time in which his people uh, benefited from slavery, but guess what? Oh, He's yeah, here yes. now. We're here now. So we all have to participate in the rectifying okay. of those no, no. of that <laughs> issue. Let me answer this question. Uh, I'm gonna, and I'm going to throw this in. Gonna, I'm going to add a little bit. Now, no impact Pokey's family history. He was a poor white man. His whole family was a poor white man. Yeah, I'm afraid and I got a little no obedient they, box. They took, they took no Chicken advantage, sell. any type of financial it's advantage of yeah. what happened. So are we to say that those individuals that because of the skin because of the skin color, they should automatically be punished for, for because of the actions of other people who match the skin color but benefited from that whole See, thing? See, the problem but, is the language that you're using. You said punished. Okay. Fixing a problem does not mean that I'm being about, punished. You're talking, about, you're talking about reparations. You're talking about doing reparations. Okay, which is what you said. Okay, or, or it seems like you have to repair this. How does how does a person or, or let's use repair? Okay, how does a, how does a person who had no involvement or whose family had no involvement whatsoever? Let me address the issue because I I think you muddied the water. I think Robert was very clear. It's not a personal issue. Mm -hmm. for, first of all, we're not attacking anybody personally. Yeah. But here's the reality. Let's talk about 2015 mm -hmm. public policy. I was in Philadelphia about a month ago and I saw the president of the United States speak. He said, "Look, in America today, guess what?" Uh, the national employment rate is about 5%. Mm -hmm. 
When he took office in 2008, it was like 9.5. The country was going crazy. Mm -hmm. White folks were robbing banks, stealing banks. They were going to prison all over the country because they couldn't cope. Guess what it is now for black people? 9.5, nobody says a damn thing about it. Like my point is, we have never had full employment because the country has not done the right thing. In terms of money and investments, let's talk about Austin, Texas. You had an at-large cartel-based system here in this city mm -hmm. for almost 70 years that gave white people white skin privilege. Mm -hmm. Undermined East Austin, undermined black people. That created modern day racism. You're talking about resources. Even today in 2015, all over this country, there's not resource equity. Let's talk about money and investments, because that's really the conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't need you to like me. I, I can tell this about Pokey City. <laughs> Let's talk about the budget here. I ain't there. Look, 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 look at it right now, okay? <laughs> city council budget. How much money goes to areas where black people are in terms of so, oh, 02, 21, 23, 24, 25? Oh, they have years of racism. Mm -hmm. We have to address that with dollars. Now, we're not asking for a handout. They've had it all along. Right. What we're saying is there should be a public policy that's one based on everybody getting the same kind of benefits. Okay. That's all we're saying. Now, until America does that, we're not having a serious conversation. Okay. So then, so then we're, we're dealing with, the, so in essence, we're not dealing with someone like Pokey who, whose family has never had, had any, any money. Okay. We're dealing with the people that now and the people in the past that had some type of financial gain because of what happened and, the, and, and, the, and, and because of the advantages that they've taken. Based on on the on, on the back, or for, because we made the money off the backs of other minorities. Right, right. That's what we're talking. right. But not, 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 not. with a systemic issue mm -hmm. that yeah. it has emerged out of the mindset of individuals, the top one percent. Yeah, so, okay. so it's it's a systemic issue, but we all have to participate in repairing that system. Okay, because the way the way you're making it sound, and, and, and I'm just gonna be perfectly, honest, I'm gonna be brutally honest in this part. Um, yeah. you, you're making it sound that you're, you're punishing those people that had no involvement whatsoever because of this group, select group of people that, that, that have it all. And you're saying, well, yeah. let's, include, let's include these gentlemen over here because, because they are, because as, as we, you know, folks are white. How, how? Uh, uh, hold, if, on, if, hold on here. Let's let um, uh, Mr. Lee say something and then I think we have the questions out there. I know we do. Melanie? Let's let Mr. Lee say something and come up and start, because we're going to run out of time quick. <laughs> but we do need to do this again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Melanie. But go ahead, Mr. Lee. Go ahead, Mr. Lee. Oh. Right. Right you won't bite you. I don't bite you. No. You don't bite Go ahead. In response to what's been stated by, by several several of us, I just think that, um, you know, we have to, there's a certain amount of privilege that evolved out of slavery. Mm -hmm. There's a certain amount of privilege that you enjoy because of the color of your skin, or there's certain disadvantages you have because of the color of your skin. There are certain things that happen to you that happen in your world. My world is not, we're not all in the same world, although we're in the same country. But I think in order to be, you know, my thing is, I don't know that the problem that will be solved in my lifetime, probably won't. But we have to at least begin to try to address it. My problem is, it's like, it seems as though too many people want to play like it doesn't exist or you can't talk about it because someone will get upset. And my thing is, wrestle with it. And my other thing is, I think that for, for my people, people of color, we have to, uh, really, we have to, now I was taught you have to be twice as good to get half as much. Okay. That's kind of with a lot of people. Yeah. That, that's okay. But, but my thing is, at least I, at least I have, there, there are countries on the earth where if I lived, if I was born poor as I was, I would have no chance at all to change what class of me. None whatsoever. I'd be, be in that class for the rest of my life. Fortunately, I was, in, I was, I was from a large black family. My mom, my mom and dad were both Mississippi sharecroppers. There were 11 of us, eight boys. Four of the boys have PhDs. So, but you know, so you know, a lot of it is you just have how here, much fight you have. It is how much fight you have in you. Okay. So, no. uh, if we may, we're gonna, we're gonna jump in real quick. Melanie. Yes. Well, um, tell us who you are. Maybe. Yes, Melanie DeMayo. I, I, step I up feel up. like I need to say, I was born poor, a teenage runaway, homeless, and I made. It took me 13 years to get my undergraduate degree as a single mom. I made my way being from the South and a blonde with a Southern accent did was not an advantage for me in a military environment, I can tell you. However, 
this gentleman on the end, you um, quoted scripture earlier about, so a man thinks, there he is. I really appreciate the fact that you did that because we're also taught to forgive and we're taught to not look into the past. We're told to let go of the past. And I think all of you gentlemen are leaders in our society. And my question to each of you, or even one of you is, as a leader in our society, is it really the best thing for the United States of America and for us as individuals to keep holding on to the past? Or should we be saying to people that follow us, let's forgive and let's make it a better place and let's try to move on? I'll say this really quickly, that um, the problem is we have not, we've never dealt with the past. If we deal with it and then we bring admittance to the table, then we can talk about forgiveness. Then we can talk about moving forward. But the problem is, whenever we, we want to have a discussion about what happened, which the present is built on and what the future will be built on, we get this barrage of let the past be the past. Well, let's deal with the past first. There's nothing wrong with admittance and nothing wrong with dealing with something so we can go beyond it. But the problem is, Partly that is so ugly that people don't want every other ethnicity can deal with what has happened to them But there's something about the transatlantic slave trade that nobody really wants to deal with it But if there's I agree with you There's nothing wrong with getting beyond and forgiving but first let, Let's really quick pokey. Yes, sir. You look at uh, what happened which I I'm, I'm, I'm an agreement with prayer. I'm in agreement with it but when the country is, is, is assaulted, we don't talk about forgiveness. We go hunt people down, we kill them. When uh, individuals' liberties are, are violated, when that guy came to that Marine Center and he, he killed those people, armed citizens came to protect what they saw as their right and their freedoms. But when someone came into a, that AME church and killed those poor people that were trying to serve a God, what we saw was prayer and forgiveness when that young man had not even asked for forgiveness. So I have no problem with forgiveness, mm -hmm. but we have to deal with, let's get it out. It's painful, it's ugly, but let's get it out first. Then we can deal with it. We can ask, and, and, and then we can talk about forgiveness, and we can move forward. But if we keep trying to sweep it under the rug, it will always be rear its ugly head. When I heard this thing about forget the past, forgiveness, that's automatically a defense mechanism. It's not going to happen. You know why? Because you can't deal with the issues if you forget the past. Mm -hmm. You have to confront the past. And here's my final point. Right now in Austin, Texas, and I'm not angry, if you're white, your medium income is $100,000. If you're black, it's 43000 mm -hmm. How the hell am I going to forget the past? It's all connected. I, I say again to American Austin, Texas, you can address these issues. You can through policies that are fair and balanced. These issues are going to be addressed. So, so the question is, why haven't you addressed these issues? Germany did it. And one final point. I was at a police forum about two months ago. The guy was talking about, about the Holocaust as a reference to general racial profiling. I told him he was absolutely crazy. Don't take me to Germany. Take me to America. Your Holocaust happened right here with black folks and Native Americans. See, the problem is in America, we don't deal with the past. So until you address it, you're not going to go forward. And I say once again, deal with the disparities, deal with the racism, and we can't forget the past. But until you address it, you're wasting your time. You have to address it in a meaningful way, not just talk about it. Mm -hmm. Create policies that create balance and equity. That's what good countries do. That's what fair people do. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Ma. Thank you very much. For that. Anything, Mitchell Lee? Yes. Yeah, so there, there yeah, yes, Melanie? No, there's some things that they don't trouble me, but I, they're observations that I make. I, um, everyone else watches an NBA basketball game. They probably watch the same game I watch. But when I see the Spurs play, for example, they say Tony Parker, the Frenchman. They don't describe him as being, having any particular hue. He's just Tony Parker, the Frenchman. Now, it would be nice if we could get to that. So we can't, I know, because guys, announcers say things like that, I know it's possible. But that, and to me, that's the goal. And what Nelson is talking about is precisely what I, I believe that I've shared that same belief. You know, what is desirable is equality of opportunity. Because you can't calculate the, the, the number that might be owed and due for a back bill for slavery. You can't even calculate that. Okay. 
So the only way to even begin to remedy the situation is by having policies and practices that equalize things really. And, but, but see, my thing is, I just have this crazy idea that if Houston Tillerson was there before UT, you know, you really may not even need your help. Okay, because I, else out there? Here, here, here's how, Thank you. how I really feel is this. Thank I, you, wish you, I wish you had private black charter schools and had white folks waiting in line to get in. Well, you know, many of our military friends tell us, you know, when we're out abroad, we're, we're, we're identified or, or as Americans. Yeah, that's true. When we're abroad, we're seen as Americans. When we come home, is when we we're oh, we're, we're distinguished or, or we're set as, we're, we're separated, and it's like I'll never forget a University of Texas senior young lady asked a question. She said, "Mr. Fernandez, when y'all become the majority and take over, will y'all treat us the same as we treated y'all?" And I said, "No, because we were we were raised different." But she raised a question, you know, and, and it was interesting. Paul, you have anything to contribute? Well, uh, on that line um, and on the line of economics, you know, <clears throat> when the majority of people of color are considered low income, there must be a reason why people of color or at that level in the economic structure. <clears throat> in Austin, Texas, I've seen so many businesses fail. They're owned by people of color. And I see new businesses moving in, white businesses, and they're thriving. They're thriving. Why is that? In the same corner, you know why? Because the guy that bought the property that came from California and had a million dollars in his pocket, bought the land that has a store in it, turned it into a beer joint, and then, you know, people started filling it up, and now they sit outside with their little wine glasses, <laughs> and they start, you know, doing that. Don't so tell me, that's my people too, right? That's your people, man. <laughs> but those, those, are, those are the people with more money. So, so I guess anybody other questions? Have you have a question about all this crap? Nobody wants questions. Well, I'll get into it here in a little while. There's Mr. So Thomas. Maybe Mr. Come Thomas. Come on, Mr. Robert Thomas. That they, that, that's being brought up is that we want to bring in oh, Sue a little bit more opportunity, so yeah. that so that the money that that is being dispersed, like for example, in, in, at the at the local level, maybe possibly at the at the national level, is pro, is, is provided equally amongst everybody. Is that kind of is that kind of what we're what we're kind of getting? I didn't at? say equally. Uh, the term I use is equity. It's our equal opportunity. I, I think that's important. Okay. So then we so and, and that and that's that's actually a really good idea on that part. I, I you can't yeah. argue with that part. But when, but when it comes to but when it comes to um, those people trying to gain access to that, um, there's certain I, I guess like for example every, every city has its own rules. If the person can if if you have a person regardless of color cannot gain access to cannot gain access to that because they don't meet certain criteria. What is going to be done to help those people meet the criteria to go ahead and gain access to those funds so that or, they can become successful? Or are we better off with a minority city manager or a minority judge or, you know? <laughs> Sometimes. Let, me, let, me, let me ask you a question directly. Take, a, take housing, for example. Studies show that white people get breaks all the time despite their credit. Mm -hmm. So that's not necessarily a hindrance if you, you, know, if you, if you want to be fair and equitable. Mm -hmm. So that's not the issue. For the, mo the issue is to be fair. There was a lawsuit recently in Dallas, Texas, that said, look, that y your housing policy stinks. It's racist. Supreme Court. So what I'm telling you is that a lot of times African Americans, despite having credit challenges, still should be qualifying because white people get opportunities all the time. In fact, the, the Europeans in this country were the first ones to get laws for federal housing. It wasn't even intended for them. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, once again, the fairness. Forget the, the, the barriers. If you have excess and you treat it fairly, it should be even across the board. But even in America, even Austin today, African Americans don't have access to housing. When you shift the city from, from Austin to the suburbs, guess what happened? The cost of housing. It's a game that people play. So if you got access to housing, you can have more balance. See, those are things that we can talk about sensibly and actually address if the will exists. 
Okay. I'm so happy to see everyone on the panel and um, happy to be here. What are some creative ways you've seen in your history or even in others where um, people are using protests, direct protests as a way to educate? Um, and how can we bring direct protest strategies in to areas where the folks that don't want to protest still need to be reached? Um, how can we bring education into other uh, areas besides direct protest where we can really educate and change systems and policy? For example, there's a health equity uh, movement in Austin that just popped up and it seems to be run by people of color, especially women of color. And they're looking at ways, it, actually it is a policy, for citizens to review where money is spent and if they see it not being equitable to address that before the monies are budgeted. Do you see any other strategies that we can use to address racism, institutional racism, but also using methods during direct protest? I don't, uh, <clears throat> I want to go to a point beyond that where it comes to the person. The situation that we find ourselves in. <clears throat> in fact, one of the things that uh, I ask, and actually I should be demanding, in my younger years I used to, and that's parity, not equality, because I'm starting from behind. I want to be at the beginning line. In order to get there, I need a push, a help. So parity is what I need. Once I get there, then we can start equality. But as long as I'm being denied credit, as long as I'm being put into a category. What happened where, to affirmative action? Eh, for affirmative action, that was for the bureaucrats. That wasn't for us. That was for the Democrats you voted for. Hey, yeah. And you know what? We're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you. Yeah. Didn't I tell you that a long time ago? Well, you hey, voted for the wrong people. Well, hey. And I'll tell you the truth. I'm sorry, man, but you know what? <laughs> I got I got a solution. The you fact is that okay, and and to achieve parity, first of all, we need to get financial literacy to all folks. That's where the education to start. That, that is the kind of education that helps you out of your situation. Once you learn how to deal with your own money, then you can deal with the banks on how to make money with your money. And uh, hold on here a minute, hold on. One minute response. I thought you had a, uh, you know, my wife does all that for me. Don't you have one of those? <laughs> I got a wife, but she, go ahead. <laughs> she doesn't too. Uh, no. Ms. Cardo, do you have any questions? No. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for your question. We'll save mine for the end. I think that one of the p points, um, you need both, you need direct action. For example, Nation of Islam does a great job of teaching people about what's going on. We need that in our communities always. The other point is about, about the health equity. In 2004, we did the same thing, the African American quality of life in key areas. Now you have the Hispanic quality of life. You got an Asian. They all need money. So the question is, how do you force these, these governments to, to fund people equally? That's really the issue. Retrading the same thing is not going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. We got plenty of wills out there. already exists. The question is, where's the money? When you figure that out, you're going to solve some of these problems. I'm, I have never gone to a march or protest in my life, and I probably won't. Um, I think that you missed all the fun. No, I didn't just. Didn't, I did. My, my parents couldn't pay, afford to be wearing for me to wear out my shoes. Ten That's what it come, came down to. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that if black folks would become more politically sophisticated, because. There are two things that drives politics, which drives government spending. It's money and the vote. We have the vote. But um, I don't think that it's been utilized with maximum effectiveness. If everyone knows where you stand, if you, ju if you just vo vote all one way, and it, voting that one way, you break an even, you might want to reconsider your strategy, yeah. I would think. Well, well it's the, better, the major parties. Is it better to be a wild card? Yeah, well, I know you got something to say too, Mr. The, Cargan. The, no, no, no. Yeah, let me finish. The major right. parties here in Travis County will not invest the dollars that need to be invested in order for our, to educate our people and get our people out to vote. 
it's all from far away. Hope, hope, you know, good luck. Rest of 35. You know, good luck in your race, but we don't have no money to support your race. So in order for people to get involved and get more engaged, even today, like you say, there's money. It takes money. And uh, today's parties in this, in this community, both of them, Republican and yeah, Democrat, Republican. they don't want to go there. <laughs> We've had opportunities. Yeah, oh, well, uh, <clears throat> I said, man, at least buy coffee. My God, you know. It's like any time, as a, I'm coming from an organizer, any time you want to win something, you must, uh, you know, you must wine and dine, if you will. Because either one of you, that either party comes to our community, we're not going to run to it. You know, you have to have something in order to get people involved and in order to get them engaged. And uh, when, uh, when those parties stay away, People don't turn out to vote, and they say, "Well, they don't want. They don't want to get to." It's not that they don't want to get out there to vote; is that they're not encouraged to get involved, and that's that that contributes a lot. And mm -hmm. then with the ID that y'all have out there, that doesn't help the situation at all. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah, hey, 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 you're not paying for the birth certificate, so it's all good. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say this: we're fighting a war on two fronts. Of course, it's racism. Uh, but the other thing is, um, in our community, what, I, what we would call self-hatred. Mm -hmm. And um, this year for the 20th anniversary of the Million Man March is being called Justice or Else. And we know that um, we are scheduled to pull $1.3 trillion out of the American economy this year. Um, if, in fact, that we don't receive what we are seeking after serving the country for as long as we have, we will practice what the what uh, Martin Luther King Jr. called economic withdrawal and the distribution of the pain. And so um, um, we are earmarking the first uh, national boycott uh, on these, uh, not on December 25th, but for the Christmas season. And mm -hmm. so um, if we begin to leverage some of that $1.3 trillion and back some some good and some decent politicians, if we begin to leverage some of that $1.3 trillion in uh, the purchase of our own land, the building of our own institutions, then not only do we support organizations like the NAACP and other organizations that are fighting for the change of policy, but even if we don't get those things, we will be uh, participating in a concerted effort of building our own new reality. The battle is taking place on, on multi fronts. And in fact, I was in Philadelphia again about a month ago. I stayed in a hotel owned by Vietnamese, ate in a restaurant owned by Japanese, and hung out with Chinese. Now, this is three blocks from the convention center right downtown. They own their own businesses, okay? I mean, they have restaurants on every block. That, the private model is very appropriate for African Americans as well. You got to own your own businesses. I'm a business guy. You got to do both. You got to own your own businesses, but we pay taxes. So we have to get something from the government, thus, we're not going to pay taxes. We can't just give our money away, right? Mm -hmm. So we can ask for services. But I think also you need to really promote our own businesses. When you go to many cities where you have a Chinatown, why is that? The government accepts it. They accept it in Philadelphia. But when it comes to African Americans, let's be honest about something. Historically, they haven't allowed us to do that. Our businesses were attacked and burned down and vandalized. So there's a major inconsistency in this whole conversation. That's why you have to address race and racial hatred. And the brother's right. If you love yourself, you can overcome a lot of things. But even with that aspect of it, it was imposed by people from the outside. We have to get over it. But let's talk about the manipulation that takes place within our culture. And the key to what happened to Philadelphia is they have their own culture. See, they weren't disconnected. If you have your own culture, you can get things going. And, and you're bringing up an interesting point on that. And what is being done? Uh, because we, we're, we're, you're basically saying that we, we, uh, we need to take care of that within our own community. Self-determination. Uh, I'm sorry? It's called self-determination. Yes. So what is being done for the African American? To go ahead and help do that. What 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 is what is what are the organizations out there that are helping helping people out? I mean, I, we we've talked to Isaac Rowe, who does the Man and Me. N W A C P. Nation of Islam. Okay, what are they doing? The Black Church. Okay, that's um, a good question. Um, what are they? I'm looking at the websites. Okay, what are, what is being done by the N W A C P to go ahead and raise self awareness so that they can be so that they can say, I'm better than what. They're if you read my website, we've got about 30 or 40 examples of that. First yeah. off is education. We have events every day. We also promote black-owned businesses all the time. We also support Nation of Islam because self-determination is important. There's plenty of things on our website, but it's not that simple. Because remember now, there's always opposition. 
So we're fighting a major battle. But we talk about owning your own business, about having the right to vote, about getting a good education. And more importantly, for our young black men, we need full employment. Okay, no. that, that, that's important. Those are things that we market all the time. Right. Now, is the opposition coming from inside or from outside? It comes from mostly from the outside. Okay. Well, look, a prime example today, 7th Street and Cerza Chavez, big density, condos. Many people have come in. I go to two restaurants and they're empty. I go to Los Comales, it's empty. I go to Angie's, it's empty. And I'm saying, wait a minute. What's happening here? I mean, we have five, six times more people in the area and these businesses are empty. Mm. So, no, this is, this is, but this is a real reality. That of place some, you take is always uh, full. Uh, uh, some of the behavior that needs to be changed. And that's the reason that they're empty because people. I, I agree to with that part. When it comes to capitalism, Benjamin Franklin's real stingy. You yeah, know? they are. Uh, so, you know, when you have all this business. redevelopment, even on 11th and 12th Street, it's not for our people anymore. They're not even there no more. We're going to run out of time here. All right, let me tell you something real quick. All right, as far as uh, the uh, the black organizations or su supporting black businesses, I haven't been supported by any black organizations, but we're going to talk about that a little later on a different little show. Um, I think we need to focus on the police mentality. Uh, we need to get with law enforcement and figure out how we're going to address the issue of how law enforcement actually engages with the community. Um, that's, that's a major problem, and we need to deal with that. Um, once we get past that, then we can get to uh, the financial state because we need to make sure that, you know, the families t stay intact, you know, by not putting them in jail and building more jails in this state, which is a problem, uh, wow. then giving, you know, minorities, if you want to call them that, you know, access to jobs, then, you know, I think it will solve a lot of problems there. But we got to do something about the police mentality and stop admitting well, that the police mentality you know, does not exist. Well, let, let me, well. Regarding black organization, that's a two-way street, brother. You also got to support us. You open that door, I'm just going in it. So it's a two-way street, okay? I'm not going to walk you give me my money because you're black. We have to have a certain kind of commitment, certain things. And I, and I, black and I, and I do by, donate, by, by the way, by the way, I donated a lot. By the way, I'm on 12th Street. There. there are black restaurants. I just I went there. I just, I just went there, sir. There are many black restaurants on 12th Street we support every day. So what I'm saying is, out of respect, we can have each other all the time. But it's a two-way street. So, and there's an event that's going to be coming up, and we're going to go ahead and, and, and promote it. Go ahead and it. promote that. Uh, Nelson Linder will be there Nelson next Linder week. Nelson will actually be talking uh, next week with the uh, police department and, and uh, some of the other members from the uh, Travis County. Well, um, um, now, now, now more, more, more so than talking, we're trying to promote policies okay. that get any results. Because at this point in time, it's really about enforcement. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is we nothing new. Enforcement yeah, it's enforcement. Yeah, equal protection of the law. Okay. 14th Amendment, 4th Amendment, those kinds of things. you got to enforce them. Well, I think we're just almost about time, I believe. If we're looking at the time correctly, Ms. Funky, is, this, is that correct? We've got less than a minute? She said yes. Huh? Okay, okay. Minute? anyway. Uh, we have less than... Uh, oh, we're already up. Oh, what? Bye -bye. We got to fix it. Okay, so, so we've got, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up.